let's talk about some practical considerations related to the brain activity, and this was discussed with immunotherapy as well. Patient walks in, EGFR mutated, exon 19, has sub-centimeter brain mets, or even a one-centimeter brain met. Are you comfortable sparing them approaches with radiation and just giving them a submertinib? I think for small brain metastases, one centimeter may be a little bit uh, beyond my comfort zone. But if there are a few millimeter lesions, I'm comfortable starting them on an osimertinib regimen and then watching their brain closely. But would you use symptomatic brain metastases as opposed to a I mean, I, clearly over a centimeter, centimeter and a half, we all feel nervous about not right. doing it. But should we use symptoms as that? I mean, if they're asymptomatic and they have something up to a centimeter? Right. I mean. I think it's case by case. It's, yeah. right. case it, by it's case. not yeah. often that you see a three millimeter brain lesion being symptomatic. Sure. Yeah. So it is a case by case. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what these studies show is there is activity in the brain, and uh, particularly we're going to talk about ALK, where that's again a major clinical challenge. If you look at EGFR patients, nearly 40 to 45% of them at some point during their right. course will develop brain metastases. Mm -hmm. So it's good to have a drug which has brain activity. And I think we saw this even in Aura 3 and the EGFR-TKI refractory setting, giving us emergent responses in the brain were north of 50, 60%. Mm -hmm. So right. this is a very potent drug that has, yeah. can elicit intracranial responses. That's a pretty significant activity for yeah. CNS. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. um, is there any particular patient, Suresh, that is not OC candidate, it, uncommon mutation? I mean, these weren't allowed in the, in the right. trial, and we right. have an expanded approval for a FATNIB in that setting. Right. What would you do in that So setting? Flora study specifically looked at exon 19 and exon 21 mutations, which are probably 85% of all EGFR mutations we see. Uh, at ECOG Akron, we are soon to launch a study specifically looking at insertion 20 mutation patients with osimertinib. That study will use a higher dose of osimertinib. It's a phase two study. Uh, so these kind of efforts to look at less common mutations are ongoing. The, uh, in the instance of Exxon 20, there are also some other exciting drugs in development which uh, are in clinical trials. So what we're talking about is specifically in Exxon 19 and 21 where the trials have been done and showed clear superiority. Okay. Now, what if you had a, a, a different sensitizing mutation other than the traditional ones, would you use OC up front? I mean, I, I would say it's as good as any of the other drugs at this point. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, certainly feel comfortable using it, but uh, I think we as long as I have an more. activating mutation, I'll feel comfortable using yeah. RC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. um, difficult question. I guess we're trying to figure this out, but I guess now that OC is being pushed frontline, which I think it should, and I've already started using it on my patient's frontline, what to do afterwards? Um, you've had some data uh, from your phase one or trial looking at CTD DNA analysis, looking at putative mechanisms of action, um, me mechanisms of resistant, um, resistance. We've had some data at World Lung looking at C797S and the cis and trans. We've had some data also looking at the retention of T790M versus those that don't retain T790M and how they do with osimertinib. How do we go about doing this? What's the message to the clinician right now? Is it just chemotherapy and call it a day? We're beginning to understand some of the mechanisms of resistance when you use frontline osimertinib. And what is already becoming clear is the resistance mechanisms are not the same when you use osimertinib in the second line setting right. versus when you use it in the first line setting. The C797S mutation that we see as resistance mechanism in the frontline setting does not have a coexisting T790 mutation. So that might be a patient you may actually be able to treat with a, a lot of sure. yeah. at that point. Uh, we're still learning about it and the prevalence of these resistance mechanisms are yet to be defined. Uh, but what I would say is this is a new era when erlotinib and gefitinib were used in the frontline setting, initially we did not know anything about the mechanism of resistance. And as we learned them, we brought in new drugs to treat. Now we will anticipate that this is going to happen in the frontline osimertinib scenario. There are already combination approaches people are beginning to look at, combining osimertinib with agents that could potentially block uh, known escape pathways. Uh, so those kind of approaches, I think, will help us provide these answers. Until then, in a standard of care clinical setting where you don't have a clinical trial, if a patient progresses on osimertinib, then we would put them on platinum doublet chemotherapy. And I would do the same thing, but immunotherapy wouldn't be my choice right. at osimertinib progression. Right. You know, I sometimes mm -hmm. get that question from people. I think we have to be um, they're, they're, uh, a little bit selective. There are other choices, too. Uh, we um, have been using the combination of an EGFR antibody sometimes uh, with uh, a small molecule. So still clinical trial related, but based on data with cetuximab, a fatinib in the past, uh, we've seen some activity there in the non-T790M. 
for the C uh, uh, 797S, um, sometimes going back to a first generation drug will work as well. So that, that's, that's being tried. But this is an area of, of greatest need right now because these patients have done well now for really long periods of time and to say chemotherapy is what we have for you, that doesn't go over very well. <laughs> yeah. right. But you know, one thing, that, one, one lesson I've learned over the years is don't forget the chemotherapy and you have to push it because it does have some activity. It works. Yeah, we, we are right. going to need to fight other molecular uh, yeah. therapies. And immunotherapy might work someday. You know, what about like an EGFR vaccine, Nair? Could we try to do something to sort of, even though there aren't many mutations in that tumor, can we wake up the EGFR or can we treat with an EGFR inhibitor first and sequence in some way? Is that, is that something that's a possibility? Um, probably not. I, I mean, you know, EGFR, the, mutation, it's, the mutations itself are not particularly immunogenic, so I think it, but I think that uh, there are certainly some efforts around EGFR, CMET, combination antibodies, which are, you know, looking interesting. So I think some sort of combination with an antibody approach may be, may be of interest. What about these data that CD73 is upregulated in EGFR mutant patients? Have you seen some of that? Right, so I, I think the, you know, the adenosine pathway has been sort of, um, um, uh, been been suggested as a possible uh, target for um, uh, particularly for EGFR mutant you know lung cancers, but it's seen more broadly, and there's trials that are being being conducted now.